that is so much fun because you can feel how you squeeze the grapes and, and squeeze the juice out of them. And that's how the wine is made, actually. Welcome to Portugal's Alto Douro region. Europe's oldest wine growing region and home of port wine. Here, very special grapes grow. The craftsmanship still counts. And the wine is sent through breathtaking landscapes all the way to Porto, where it can age for years. On the banks of the river Douro, the secret of this special wine region is to be found. Alto Douro is located in northern Portugal's Douro Valley. It stretches 100 kilometers inland from Porto along the Douro River. This region has been producing port wine for 350 years. A 1756 charter defined Alto Douro as a port wine production area. Many vineyards were established around this time. Their names have become well-known port wine brands. Croft is one of them. Its managing director, Adrian Bridge, tells me more about the region. Hello. Hello. Well, welcome to Quinta de Rueda um, in the middle of harvest time. Uh, a perfect moment to see uh, a Douro vineyard from the oldest wine region in the world and in fact to have a chance to see port being made but also the way they've been making it for centuries. We're going to try and get your feet just to give you an experience, <laughs> get your feet into oh, the wine. I'm looking forward to that. Okay, we'll start with the vineyard. Okay. It is one of the oldest and most traditional quintas, as the wineries here are called, and it lies in the heart of the Douro Valley. For anyone visiting, the drama of these hills, the, the everywhere you go, there's another view um, and another point of beauty. And, and that, you know, that gets into the soul. What we get in Wines of the Douro Valley is you get um, great intensity of flavour. I mean, that we have these natural grape varieties, we have the, this incredible climate, um, a lot of hot conditions. These, these grape varieties are used to it. The soil is, as you can see, there's, there's, it's very low in organic, it's, it's very high in mineral, um, and it produces wonderfully big and intense wines, a lot of depth and a lot of volume. That's why you know, we make port here, and that's why we make port here for hundreds of years. And it's about the richness. It's about the richness that you can um, bring from the soil into the wines. The region is known for the diversity of its grape varieties. Most of them thrive exclusively here. They could not be cultivated in any other climate. And then we taste it, I mean, just chewing it around, it's quite dry, the skin, and that's the tannins. Okay, so this is, this is where you have to make that bounds. Um, which is all about the winemaking process. The land and the people are inseparably connected with the viticulture here. In the past, the region was isolated and difficult to reach. It is a miracle that wine can be grown here at all. Since 2001, the Alto Douro wine region has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's probably the most beautiful wine region in the world. And what makes it extraordinary is this is the intervention of, of mankind. You know, mankind has taken a slope, they've cut it, they've made these dry stone walls. You know, this is, this is real human ingenuity to transform a wild landscape into something that can be uh, used to plant, uh, to plant vines. On the Quinta da Roeda, the grape harvest has just ended. I stopped by the winery. Here, the grapes are processed, crushed in traditional granite vats, and brought to fermentation. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Good taste of wine. It is. As in the old days, the winemakers still do this with their bare feet. But this is unique. I mean, there's, there's virtually nowhere else in the world where foot treading still takes place, and, and we're doing it. And importantly, the reason we're doing it yeah. is it produces the best port. And we don't know whether it's precisely because um, of the human foot itself or whether as he lifts it up, you can see more of the liquid is exposed to the air. Maybe it's a little bit of that's happening. Maybe it's the fact that his legs are warm and therefore um, that helps. You know, we don't know 
because the thing about winemaking, yes, it's part science, mm -hmm. but it's also part art. Of course, I want to try that out. What is usually practiced in large groups, the boss shows me personally. Quickly clean your feet and All off right. you go. Focus. Just getting in. <laughs> How's that? Oh, yeah. You have to get used to it. That's nice. Yeah. So you see, you're just pushing the skins and that against the base of the lagar. Okay. And that's squeezing and removing. Just on one yes. on one spot? Or yeah, I mean, two? normally what would happen is normally we would have like two hours of people here, uh -huh. left, okay. right, left. Okay. And then after that, when there's a little bit more, because at the moment it's really quite hard, uh -huh. but then people do the singing and dancing. <laughs> <laughs> That is so much fun because you can feel how you squeeze the grapes and, and squeeze the juice out of them. And that's how the wine is made, actually. This is making wine. And this is how wine's been made for thousands of years. Yeah. The river used to be the only way to bring wine to Porto before the railroad came and the area was later opened up by the road network. At the train station in Pinhao, painted tiles tell of the former hardships of winemaking. Transportation was especially exhausting and dangerous. Many inhabitants of the region still know the stories from their own families, like Paulo Saavedra. In those times we used the current of the river, because the river is a mountain river, with a lot of current, a lot of rapids, very difficult, very hard. Many times we lose boats and we lose uh, people, but we never lose barrels of wine, because we don't fill the barrels until the top. We leave somewhere inside of the barrel, then they could float, you see? Uh -huh. Then they stop in one place and we go there and we catch the, we save the port wine. Boats used to take eight days to get to Porto, hence the name port wine. From here, the sweet wine, fortified with brandy, was shipped mainly to England. But until the time came, the wine barrels were stored. And that is still the case today. In Villa Nova de Gaia, directly opposite the old town of Porto, are the warehouses of the large port wine companies. But like here at Taylor's, the port wine does not only mature. Master blenders create different varieties from individual vintages, as Ana Margarida Morgar tells me. Port wine is so much parts that are uh, man essential, so that you cannot substitute by a machine. Port wine, because it ages in wood for decades, sometimes centuries, you are uh, blending and fine-tuning the wine during decades, sometimes centuries. Due to the higher alcohol content of port wine, it can also mature longer and so develop even more subtle flavors. I have a lot of respect because all this represents a lot, a lot of work. So that's why port wine should be enjoyed and not just drink like enjoyed. The proof of the pudding is always in the eating. We drink white and red port wine <laughs> varieties that are 10 and 20 years old. My slight reservations about sweet wine evaporate. It makes me sort of um, curious in a way. <laughs> Port wine, a lot of the secrets is this balance between the acidity and sugar. That is very good. It's, it's a sweet wine, but you don't. Fa you, in the end, what you have is the freshness of the acidity. However, with 20% alcohol content, port wine should be enjoyed in moderation. I am quite impressed with the amount of craftsmanship that goes into making the port wine, and I would never have thought that port wine comes in so many different styles and that its taste can be so varied. And are you tempted to take a trip to Porto or the Douro Valley? Or would you prefer to drink a glass of port wine at home?